You know that feeling? The one when you're about to go in front of a class to make a report on something uh, you're, you're really not prepared for? You with me? Okay, now multiply that audience by 10,000, and that's me. Uh, let's begin our 100th official video. A thief, mobster, and samurai walk into a bar. They rob it. That is the secret formula for one of the greatest anime of all time, Lupin the Third. This show is the pinnacle of heist of the week, peppered with cheesy jokes, funny hijinks, and a sprinkle of perpetual unparalleled success. Lupin the Third is unmatched in its insane creativity that shapes itself into various heists for the miraculous treasures of the world. It's also split into six parts, consisting of about 302 episodes, 11 feature films, 6 OVAs, and multiple manga series that are very difficult to navigate. So here's a little inside baseball for you. Tyler and I actually watch or read everything that we make videos on in their entirety. To give you an idea of that, uh, go take a look at our videos page. Or how about this, our channel's anime list isn't even up to date, and I'm well past 115 straight days of watching anime. If you add on the 55 days of straight reading manga, the fact that I also watch anime and read manga for fun, and I have a family and make videos, I, maybe you'll get the picture. We have always planned on doing a Lupin video, or even a series of them, but as you should be aware of, now at this point, it takes time. It takes a massive amount of time. However, in a minute, you are going to see why we chose now to begin our dive into this massive franchise. Now is a strange time. Longtime fans know that it's Hellmouth. It is time for hyperviolence and horror, but Lupin presents us with a unique opportunity. True to the of the week formula, most episodes of the show have nothing to do with each other except that they revolve around our main gang of villains, Lupin, Jigen, Goemon, and Fujiko. Each is as uniquely interesting as they are varied from the other. Since the manga debuted in 1967, there's been a steady, albeit inconsistent, stream of episodes from 1971 all the way through the newest release in 2021. That makes Lupin one of the oldest running series to date, and while many of the stories take place within the realm of reality, here and there, we get a touch of the intangible, the strange, the extraordinary, the occult. How has one group of characters maintained such popularity over 50 plus years, and how does the occult fit into Lupin? The answer, my friends, may be stranger than you ever would have thought. So this is Lupin under the magnifying glass, a snippet of a larger picture, but one of the utmost importance to retention and longevity. If you've ever been curious about why the fantastical seems to pop up in this show despite the series taking place in our real world, if you love the spooky ooky, or perhaps you simply love Lupin, you're in the right place. Here is an occult video for a cult-like fanbase that's helped elevate Lupin into a timeless work of art. This is Lupin the Third and the Occult. Let's get into it. Dear Bonsai Pop, if you call Italy the land of love, then all the love is in my hand. To prove so, I stole a coupon code just for you. BP Lupin. Applicable to get a $25 discount in Lupin the Third. We are immensely grateful for your support as a member of the collector community. Yeah, blah blah blah, I'm great. Keep a lookout for the Lupin the Third Elite Diorama statue sneaking up on the collector community this October 22nd. We heard a certain gentleman thief caught wind of these pieces, so be sure to get them before he does. So you know I said that we were planning on making a Lupin video eventually? Uh, well, the time is now because Figurama has come to us and asked us to promote their new statue and we never pass up a chance to talk about an amazing anime and help you guys get the best anime statues on the market. This Lupin piece is absolutely incredible guys. It's the first time Lupin, Fujiko, and Jigen have ever been together on a statue and references the original art for Lupin the Third Part 4, The Italian Job. Figurama's pre-orders almost always sell out within 24 hours. This is your once in a lifetime chance to own something that you will value forever. Figurama collectors are still the absolute best at what they do and that is why to this day with over 100 
episodes, they are the only anime figure company that we have ever worked with. So pre-order one of these statues before they sell out. The orders open October 22nd at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Seriously, set an alarm as soon as possible if this is something you want for October 22nd, 10 a.m. Eastern, and use our code. Thanks to Figurama Collectors for sponsoring and on with the show. My friends, the occult is one of the most fascinating aspects of the human condition. We seem to naturally lean towards mysticism and magical explanations to mystery as a species. If science is an explanation of an effect by means of a cause, the occult is more about the effect materializing for its own sake. It's an all-encompassing term, practice, science, study, whatever you want to call it, of the supernatural. We're talking magic, alchemy, cryptids, rituals to gods of the unknown, you name it. The term occultism itself was first coined in 1800s France. Ironically, not too far from where our story starts. So Lupin, some history. He is the grandson of Arsene Lupin, the gentleman thief of Maurice Leblanc's famous series of stories that go by the main character's name. The original Arsene Lupin was pretty popular back in France in the early 20th century. He featured as the main characters in 17 novels and 39 novellas. I don't even think I've read that many novellas. For those that don't know, Arsene Lupin is often described as the French counterpart to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. That's how big we're talking here. LeBlanc even used Sherlock Holmes in a few Arsene Lupin stories, which the Doyle estate didn't take kindly to, uh, so he was forced to change the name to Herlock Sholmes to avoid copyright issues until Sherlock Holmes became public domain. Arsene Lupin is also a literary descendant of Pierre Alassis Ponson du Terrel's fictional character Rocambeau. And if I pronounce any of that wrong, I'm sorry, I don't do French. But it seems almost fated that LeBlanc's Lupin would later become the fictional ancestor of Lupin III. It takes some serious balls to say, yeah, I like that character, let's steal that IP and make an entirely new series based on his grandson. But like grandfather, like grandson, I guess. And where would we find those cojones? But on Kazuhiko Kato, or his more widely known moniker, Monkey Punch. Much like his creator, Lupin III also has some hefty bags in his britches. He travels the world hatching intricate plans and stealing wonders we could only ever hope to get our hands on. Lupin III, grandson of Arsene Lupin, now holds the title of the world's greatest thief as his own. He travels the world announcing his intention to steal valuables by sending a calling card to their owners. And if you've ever played Persona 5, that probably sounds familiar. It was all a reference, my dudes. Lupin steals from the rich and gives to himself and his associates, the aforementioned crew of diverse miscreants. Jigen, Lupin's right-hand man, is a slick gunslinger heavily inspired by American gangsters. He's constantly dressed to the nines in a suit and fedora while toting a revolver as his main weapon of choice. He's Lupin's best friend and most loyal friend throughout all of their heists. In stark contrast to Jigen is Fujiko Mine, a gorgeous woman that often ends up working with Lupin only to double-cross him right before they get their prize. She's a master of disguise and accents. Lupin is constantly crushing on her, which kind of gives you an idea why he's okay keeping her around despite her constant betrayals. And that just leaves Goemon, a samurai that was included because Monkey Punch thought the story needed a samurai. Now Goemon was originally an assassin sent to kill Lupin. However, they both survive, and a couple episodes later, Lupin tries to steal the secret formula that makes Goemon's sword indestructible. And after failing, Goemon slices Lupin's car in half. They both break down laughing and Goemon decides to join the gang permanently. So yeah, he is a samurai with an unbreakable sword that can cut through literally anything. Combined, these four make up the main characters in the story, working together to pull off heists, only for Fujiko to betray Lupin near the end by working with his enemies, or Inspector Zenigata, who is the chief authority on Lupin, and falls him all over the world in an attempt to arrest the slippery thief guy. The gang ends up stealing their target, or Fujiko wins one on occasion, Zenigata is left shaking his fist about how he'll catch Lupin next time, much like a human Tom and Jerry stick. The next episode progresses like it's just another day in the life of the world's top thief. And like I mentioned earlier, Lupin's world is set in reality. However, in his main crew, if you paid attention, we already have a character with an impossible weapon, a sword that doesn't break. I mean, how many stories have you heard about magical swords? However, alchemy, which lies well within the realm of occultist practice, is a pseudoscience. Most of you guys have probably seen Full Metal Alchemist, uh, actual real world alchemy didn't really work like that, but its history is insanely dense and convoluted. However, one of its main goals was to find certain mystical metals. You may have heard of adamantium or adamantite or 
or Calcum, for instance, the ancient metal described by Plato as coming from Atlantis. Well, the Japanese actually have their own version of super hard, rust-proof fantasy metal called Hihi Irokane. Now granted, this metal is supposed to be red or scarlet, but as early as chapter 28 in the manga, we already have a casual impossibility happening within the story of Lupin III. And while it can be passed over as, yeah, anime guy with an unbreakable sword, typical stuff, the reality is, is that this sets a precedent for the entire series. So Lupin's gang travels to steal precious items despite any and all defense mechanisms or anti-theft technology, but every so often there is an episode that isn't normal. Instances when Lupin the Third goes off the rails. Mind control, curses, aliens, vampires, Loch Ness, psychics, cults. There's so many fantastical aspects portrayed throughout Lupin, and yet sometimes those same pieces are just a twist and turn out to be fake, but others, they're not. Check this out. In Lupin Part 2, Episode 3, it turns out that Fujiko's singing can call the Loch Ness Monster up from the depths, proving once and for all that everybody is a simp for Fujiko. The rest of the gang travels to Scotland to see Fujiko's new siren song abilities in action. However, they're not the only ones who've taken an interest in her vocals. Dr. Oz, no relation to the psychopathic MAGA simp you've seen on TV, has also taken note of Fujiko's miraculous control of the beast. He's bald and has a monocle that is also an eye patch. Uh, wonder if he's the bad guy. Dr. Oz decides to use Fujiko's singing to draw out Nessie for imprisonment. He's been attempting to capture and display Nessie his entire life as revenge for it snacking on his legs years ago. Think about it kind of like a Captain Ahab and the White Whale vibe, but you know, instead with uh, one of the most famous cryptids in human history. Midway through the episode, the gang gets eaten by Nessie only to show up in a submarine, and I was immediately like, oh, this is some Scooby-Doo bullshit. This old dude made a mechanical Nessie so he could capture it and make millions as the person who quote-unquote captured captured the Loch Ness Monster. Pretty sure there's a Scooby-Doo episode with that exact plot, and I know that there's a Gravity Falls episode with that same setup too. No big deal, been there, seen that, but I was wrong. Dr. Oz created the submarine not to fool the world into believing in the Loch Ness Monster, but in an attempt to woo the real Nessie close enough to capture it. He's basically trying to honeypot a fictional dinosaur that isn't fictional here. Nessie is trapped by the evil doctor who freezes the monster in ice and starts transporting it. Lupin's gang saves Nessie with some well-placed explosives in an acapella performance by Fujiko recorded on tape, freeing the monster who immediately kills Dr. Oz and dives back under the waves. Good guys win, bad guys lose, roll credits. And if this was any other anime, I guess it would be, you know, whatever, move on. But honestly, this single episode here kind of took me for a ride. At first, I thought it was a Fujiko scheme to steal from Lupin, and then I thought it was a Dr. Oz scheme to hoodwink the world with a fake Loch Ness monster and Fujiko was in on the plan. But instead, Nessie was real the entire time. In the world of Lupin III, the Loch Ness monster is real. The end result of the mystery was that Nessie equals fact. No one was lying or cheating anyone else. For a show to steer me in the wrong assumption not once but twice in a half hour viewing, it's pretty phenomenal. I analyze anime for a living. To have a single episode so easily upstage what I expected taught me something. Lupin the Third is special because there is no obvious formula to what's going to happen. The supernatural is just as likely as any other answer. This isn't Scooby-Doo. There's not always some man behind the mask or an explanation to the unknown. Sometimes the unknown has no explanation in Lupin, but sometimes it is just like Scooby-Doo. Take episode 94 of part two as an example. This episode is titled Lupin vs. Superman. I don't know how they got through that copyright. And the basic plot is that a Superman figure is flying around this American city and every time he shows up, all the people in the area get overly excited and crowd around the building he's standing on to see him. While Superman is there distracting everyone, a group of thieves are robbing nearby banks that are emptied because everybody wants to see Superman. First thing you're gonna notice is that Monkey Punch makes Americans seem pretty stupid, which we are, so well done. Second, after watching the Loch Ness episode, Episode, who's to say that Superman isn't actually real? Here's a dude with a chiseled jaw flying around town. That's Superman in a nutshell. It's only at the end of the episode that we learn that the flying is done by jetpack and the whole thing is completely bogus. So sometimes the occult stuff is real, sometimes it's completely fabricated with science, and sometimes it's both. There's an episode where the police hire a psychic to help capture Lupin. Throughout the entire episode, a bird is following Lupin around. You're like, oh, it's just a, you know, it's like a mechanical spy bird, right? This lady's not a psychic, she's just using technology to 
predict the future. The bird is transmitting video to a crystal ball. Easy peasy. Except midway through this episode, that bird starts brainwashing and hypnotizing people. By the end of the episode, the bird and crystal ball are destroyed, revealing that they are in fact technology, but the psychic's powers are legitimate, just amplified by the technology she was using so her abilities could take effect over great distances. I'd also like to point out that the police and FBI have used psychics on many occasions to try and find missing people or criminals. I'm not joking. That being said, it usually turns out bad. But this is what I'm getting at, right? I've cherry-picked three specific episodes here out of hundreds, but this is how it goes with Lupin the Third in general. You just don't know what is going to happen because there is no formulaic solution to the heists. For a story that takes place in the real world, specifically our world, or the world that at least uh, Maurice LeBlanc created in his Arsene Lupin series, Monkey Punch tweaks it on a whim to allow for the fantastical when it suits him. But only on occasion. The vast majority of Lupin episodes have no mention of the occult, but the ones that do drive the show from great to exceptional because you can't just assume to know what's happening. Usually by that point you've gotten lulled into a sense of natural reliability, right? The idea that any and all things can be explained by logic, then BAM! Lupin just barely nudges us past the cemented rules of reality. Sometimes the mystical isn't mystical at all, sometimes it's just a tech trick, which is something that we deal with on a regular basis and can be explained with science. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. But sometimes it's technology to enhance the supernatural. But other times it's actually a curse that possesses the wearer of an ancient Egyptian mask with the soul of a pharaoh. But even in that episode, Possessed Lupin starts floating, you're like, oh shit, it's got magical pharaoh powers i know we're superstitious but are we this superstitious only to find out that he's being held up with a transparent kite there's an entire episode about collecting ancient relics from stonehenge there's three in a set there's a ghost ship in the bermuda triangle but the ghost ship is actually a, just a submarine and i thought it was actually a ghost ship at first but then realized again just technology only for the gang to finally get all three of these ancient relics together at stonehenge and get contacted by aliens and the episode just ends and of course the next is like it never even happened but this is the genius behind lupin for everything you think you know the show is going to yank the rug out from under you by saying oh yeah the occult is possible in this world you'll just never know when it's actually real until the end of the show and even then sometimes you're left wondering and wonder is a powerful thing there's an episode that starts with Lupin having athlete's foot, right? And his doctor tells him there's no cure unless he can steal ancient Egyptian lotus seeds. Except the seeds don't exist because it was all set up by Fujiko Zenigata and the doctor. But with this series, you're constantly kept on your toes, all right? Constantly guessing what's real and what isn't, and it's almost never the way you think it's going to be. The addition of the occult in Lupin is a masterclass in how to remove the limitations of the setting on your creation without overtly creating a fantasy world. And here's the thing. I can't even fully credit Monkey Punch for this. Maurice LeBlanc also had fantasy elements in his Arsene Lupin series, just like there was fantastical elements in Sherlock Holmes with Moriarty, for example. The Fountain of Youth, a godstone that cures mutations and causes mutations, and perhaps the most important piece, Josephine Balsamo, Arsene Lupin's arch enemy and lover. Maybe the name Balsamo rings a bell to you. Josephine Balsamo is the alleged granddaughter of Alessandro Cagliostro also known by the alias of occultist Giuseppe Balsamo, one of the most famous occultists in history. Also, Cagliostro is probably ringing bells from arguably the most famous piece of Lupin media, the castle of Cagliostro. But Giuseppe was associated with the royal courts of Europe, where he was known to perform various occult acts like psychic healing, alchemy, and scrying. And I don't think that it's far-fetched to say occultist blood literally runs through Lupin the Third's veins. And I'm not here to pretend to be an expert on this series, right? I'm just dipping my toes in. But the occult is inherently tied to Lupin the Third through the bloodline of his ancestor and woven into the world of a series that is within the realm of reality. Both Arson Lupin and Lupin the Third's stories take place in our world 100% of the time. But sometimes something magical is happening and you just don't know if it's real or not until the plot decides to clue you in on the truth. And for a story about the world's greatest thief, a master of disguise and stealth, the lying narrative of what you see versus what's actually happening perfectly helps immerse the viewer in the world of lies and deceit 
that Lupin lives in. Despite making the world less grounded, it makes the story so much more immersive because you just can't assume that what's happening on screen is fake because it should be in reality. Sometimes Lupin turns into a vampire, only to not actually have been turned into a vampire. But there are actual vampires in the episode, so if vampires exist, Lupin turns into one, but he's just disguising himself as one, so you think vampires are real, and Lupin's actually been turned until the very end. It's pure genius to constantly lie to your audience about the occult, while simultaneously not lying about the occult existing in the world. It makes you question what is and isn't real, and anytime something seems supernatural, it always ends up to be both real and a trick at the same time. But then again, is that really so unrealistic? As I stated earlier, humans tend to naturally lean towards the fantastical. We've done so since the beginning of time. It's almost like it's biologically locked into us, creating gods and magic to explain away things that we didn't understand. In the 21st century, a time when churches are losing their shit over empty pews, and the majority of people have the expanse of human knowledge at their literal fingertips, magic still happens. There are phenomena that occur on a regular basis that still can't be explained away with logic and science. Coincidence luck, trick of the light, or spiritual intervention, it's left up to the individual to navigate these scenarios using their foundation of reality. Are miracles pure probability, or is there something more? Why would you survive a terrible car accident when somebody you know died in a relatively harmless one? The fabric of the reality in which we exist is purely built on faith and belief on adherence to the agreed-upon regulations of culture, society, and accepted rules of science. However, humans have been very wrong before. People holding advanced degrees have used their perceived status as society's betters to push not only bad ideas, but straight-up false information. So the question remains as it always has, what do we actually know we know? Well, again, I am currently navigating my way through this series. I found Monkey Punch's practice of interweaving the occult into the realistic basis of Lupin III a subtle magic trick of his own. While we look at some of the longer-running series in history, we have to ask how they stay relevant. When we look at Lupin for that example, we get an actual answer. Endless possibility. The universe, the real universe, is truly vast. And in the big scheme of things, we know nothing. But we expect guaranteed outcomes. Lupin guarantees nothing. You don't know what you're going to get going in, and you don't know what you got until the very end. And it truly could be anything. That in and of itself is the human experience. It's what makes life so fun to live, even when it sucks. And while we dismiss the occult as flights of fancy, the truth is that there's more logic to rejecting the idea of impossibility rather than accepting it. But like I've said, I'm just getting started. Think of this as a thesis to a thesis. I hope I did Lupin the Third a little justice, and I will continue to dig into this series, not just for you, but for me too, because honestly, I'm having a lot of fun. In the meantime, I would really like to know what you think and what some of your favorite or recommended episodes of Lupin are. How's the manga compared to the show? This is a series with a hugely dedicated fan base, and I would like to provide some more content for them and for our beautiful regular audience regarding this series. So please, give me some ideas, and of course, let me know if I messed up. I'm sure you will without me asking, but you know, hey, now I did. Shoutouts to Figurama for sponsoring this video. Guys, don't forget to set your alarms for October 22nd at 10 a.m. Eastern and use our code BPLUPIN for $25 off. You can go join the wishlist right now on their website. Thank you to our high tier patron of the week, One Punch Gentleman, and our lucky patron of the week, Banana Bomb. While you're here, why don't you check out some of the rest of our videos? I'm Mike, this is Bonsai Pop, and I'll see you next time.